Freud and Religion. One in a series of programs dealing with some of the discoveries and errors of Sigmund Freud. A series titled, Man is Not a Thing. First, you will hear Dr. Eric Fromm, psychoanalyst and author, as recorded in his study in Cuernavaca, Mexico. Then, you will meet Robert Nisbet, Dean of the College of Letters and Science, University of California, Riverside, together with Floyd Ross, Professor of World Religions at the Southern California School of Theology, and Dr. Edward Rudin, Chief Psychiatrist of the California State Mental Hygiene Clinic in Riverside. Now, here is Eric Fromm, as interviewed by John Harder in Cuernavaca, Mexico. Dr. Fromm, today there seems to be a considerable easing of the tension between psychoanalysis and religion. It's perhaps less frequently that Sigmund Freud is viewed as a kind of, well, incarnate antichrist, I believe was the phrase used once. But is it now, or for that matter, was it ever entirely accurate to say that he was an enemy of religion? Well, Mr. Harder, uh, that is in a way difficult to say. It would be easy to say Freud was an enemy of religion. But really, uh, the answer is less easy if we try to understand what kind of religion are we talking about. Freud wrote a book which dealt with religion almost exclusively, which he called The Future of an Illusion. And Freud there spoke about a certain type of religion, which in fact, I'm afraid, is a kind of religion most people have in which God is seen as an enlarged father figure of whom one expects help if one is in need, whom one thanks if one is lucky or successful, but about whom one cares very little otherwise. Uh, Freud said that this kind of religion is actually only the repetition of the infantile attitude of the attitude of the child toward father, the child who does not trust his own powers yet, and who runs to father, or we might even say to mother, when it is in need of help. That this is an illusion, uh, because in fact there is no such father or no such mother, that all we have to go by is our own reason, our own energy, our own willpower and our own conscience. And in this little book, The Future of an Illusion, Freud criticized religion from this standpoint. And uh, as far as that is concerned, one might call him an enemy of religion, provided one believes that that is the true essence of monotheistic religion. Mm -hmm. Well, is it merely that he saw here, in, to his own view, an illusion, or was he concerned with what this illusion did, either for or to people? Uh, well, indeed, he was concerned what this illusion did to people. Uh, he was he concerned with the fact, as he saw it, that by relying on this illusion, people fail to develop confidence in their reason, confidence in the autonomy of their own decisions, and go on behaving like children. But, you see, to come back to your question, was Freud an enemy of religion? I would have to say that in a certain sense in the first place, Freud was in the religious tradition in one respect at least, namely in his belief in truth, in his belief in conscience and responsibility. But that is not enough. In discussing religion, Freud did not discuss, and I'm afraid he did not understand, that this empirical picture of religion in which God is an enlarged father is indeed not only not the essence, but actually the contrary of what the great humanistic, uh, monotheistic and not monotheistic religions teach. What did they teach? They taught in the first place that God is unknowable, that you must not use God's name in vain, that you must not make a picture of God, that God is not a thing and God is not a person. But God is a word for that which we do not understand and yet which is the aim of all our strivings. In other words, to put it slightly differently, what monotheistic religion really meant was in his concept of God, that God represented the idea of truth and of love and that man's religious task in the world 
was not simply to believe in such an idea, but to take it seriously, to have it as his ultimate concern, and to live his life in such a way that to develop his capacity for love and to develop his capacity for reason are the main aims to which his whole life is devoted. Freud did not see this side of religion. He was in an anti-clerical tradition of rationalism, but I would not say that Freud was an enemy of religion. I would say he criticized the current religion as it is to be found in most people, and our task would be to develop a concept of religion which goes back to its roots, to its essence, and in this respect, I do not think that there would be an essential conflict with Freud. Uh, but perhaps I could say one more word here. You mentioned the fact in your question in the beginning that it seems that today there is a good deal of rapprochement between psychoanalysis and religion. Uh, some people think that is a very good thing. But I'm afraid sometimes that this is not such a good thing. Uh, that sometimes uh, the ministers don't have enough faith in the truth of the religious teaching and the psychoanalysts might not have enough faith in the efficiency of their therapy and that sometimes they get together each hoping that the other one would remedy the defects of his own procedure. I think we should take religion seriously and should see that a great deal of what is today praised as religious revival is nothing but the crudest form of idolatry. We think if we speak of God, we speak of God. But if one speaks of Baal and Ashtate or any other heathen idol, we speak of an idol. The name doesn't matter. What matters is that the whole discovery and the revolutionary idea of monotheism was to choose as an object for worship that which is not limited which is not a thing. And we are today in the great danger of worshipping God as an idol and in addition to make him a partner in business. And in government, perhaps. And in government, I'm afraid so too. You have heard Dr. Eric Fromm, psychoanalyst and author, as recorded in his study in Cuernavaca, Mexico. Now to continue our discussion of Freud and religion, we'll switch to Studio C at San Bernardino Valley College, where we'll join Dean Robert Nisbet of the University of California, Riverside, Professor Floyd Ross of the Southern California School of Theology, and Dr. Edward Rudin, Chief Psychiatrist of the Riverside State Mental Hygiene Clinic. Dean Nisbet is our moderator. Well, gentlemen, these remarks of Dr. Fromm seem to me, at least, to be very provocative indeed on a subject that is central in our time, as I suspect it has been in most other times. Professor Ross, you're certainly the obvious and logical one to begin our discussion this time. I like what Dr. Fromm has said. I think that, unfortunately, Freud has sometimes been thought of as being just an enemy of religion, I see him, with many of my colleagues in the field of religion, as an enemy of immature forms of religion. I'm not at all persuaded that he was aware of some of the deeper dimensions of the religious search, as Dr. Fromm has also indicated. But certainly religion probably includes all the crimes in the book of humanity, crimes of behavior and of attitude, but religion has also included most of the glories and most of the aspirations of human beings. And just as there are mature and immature forms of loving and of the production and consumption of goods, so certainly there are both mature and immature forms of religion. And I imagine that as a psychiatrist, you bump into this very frequently, do you not, Dr. Rudin? We certainly do, uh, Professor Ross. The... Uh comment that uh, Fromm made uh, about uh, Freud's view of religion providing this figure of the uh, almighty father in the literal sense of his being uh, omnipotent and almighty and being able to provide everything, and uh, the uh, concern that Freud had that uh, this would lead to some failure on the part of individuals who relied on this almighty father, some failure on the parts of these individuals to develop confidence in, their, in themselves. 
uh, seems to me to um, represent one of the uh, weaknesses, uh, however, in uh, the evaluation of uh, even this aspect uh, of the religious experience. Uh, we know that uh, one of the ways in which uh, an individual does indeed develop some confidence in himself is through an identification uh, with a parent or parent figure who represents uh, some concepts of strength uh, to him. Is it not possible, then, that by an individual's uh, projecting before himself this image uh, of an omnipotent father, that he might actually increase his own confidence in himself by being able to identify with this father? Yes. I think what often happens, unfortunately, is that the growing child, and even the young adult, not having worked through the problem of the dependency relationship with the mother, never even gets on to the place where he can identify with a heavenly father, as we find it described in the history of religions. Thus, in all of our historic religions still existing today, we find many people who have never left the first stage of what I would call a relatively immature form of religion. And it's interesting that in order to break with the mother goddess or the figure of the great mother, both in the personal and the transpersonal sense, Apparently, the human psyche has to identify with the father principle, usually projected outward in terms of a heavenly father. Are you saying, Professor Ross, that there are uh, uh, two parent figures in uh, one's religious experience as there is in, in one's uh, other personal experience, uh, that there is a father uh, which represents God and that there is a mother which represents church itself, the structural formation which is supposed to lead us uh, to God? and that we may perhaps get bound up in our relationships with the mother aspect, the formal structured church, uh, and uh, thereby never permit ourselves the identification with the father? Very definitely. For many people who are in the official positions, let's say the medicine men and the priests of past and present, not having worked through their own problem of the relationship to the mother figure, are quite happy to encourage others to remain in this womb-like situation and do not care to have uh, the children disturbed unduly. In other words, we have a problem inside the religious institution, just as every individual has a problem in his relationship to the search for a larger reality. I'd like to bring the discussion for a moment, if you don't mind, back to the, for me, rather central question, at this point, and that was literally Freud's attitude toward religion. Dr. Fromm, for all of the insightful and careful nature of his remarks, seems to me to skirt rather gently, perhaps sympathetically, this question. I think, personally, that Freud has to be regarded as completely opposed to religion, as that word can most accurately be defined. I don't think it is enough to say that Freud, being a friend of truth, <coughs> believing in the dignity of the human being, was therefore religious. Professor Ross? Let me make a distinction between the use of the word religion as commonly applied by, say, the man in the street, and religion as it describes, say, the dynamic reach of man's life in his reference to the deepest springs of his experience. If we take the word religion, even in its Latin rootage, it means that which binds back, which can be given a purely legalistic definition, as the Romans tended to do, but it also has a basic psychological meaning, that which binds together. And one of the Sanskrit words, usually translated as religion, dharma, also means that which binds together or gives coherence. Now let's just look at Freud's theory for a moment. He talked about the id, the ego, and the superego, and talked about the conflicts between these and the problems in the life of the growing child. Religion in the psychological sense, as I'm using the term now, would be that which binds together in a meaningful coherence the force of the id, the reality of the ego, and the significance and reality of the superego. In other words, religion as religio means psychologically considered that which binds together, or to borrow a word from my psychiatric colleagues, that which integrates man at the highest and the deepest levels of his own personality. Well, I can understand that, and I think it's worth pointing out that in the 19th century, for several decades before Freud, 
There were a number of European thinkers. I think, for example, of Auguste Comte in France and uh, old Harriet Martineau and others in England who were much impressed by that aspect of religion which <coughs> you, Professor Ross, have just brought out here, namely the binding together. And we find these people, many of them, attempting to found a religion of humanity, for example, in which humanity itself was the central being in which the whole emphasis was upon the bringing together of human beings. I, I think, Dr. in Rudin? fact, uh, Dean Nisbet, that you uh, are pointing to a basic area of conflict uh, between Freud and religion. Fromm spoke of the humanist conception of God uh, as the uh, uh, symbol of truth, as the symbol of love. And at the same time, uh, he spoke of God as being unknowable, uh, as God, uh, God's name uh, not to be used in vain, uh, as um, a God which was really unattainable, uh, which was really uh, unknowledgeable or unknowable for us. Now, if we combine these two, uh, doesn't this give us a picture uh, of a, even a humanist religion uh, in which we are not to know truth and love? We are not to know the very symbol, which is the symbol of truth and of love. And this was, of course, exactly the antithesis of what Freud felt, that he must know truth and he must know love. Could I make a distinction there, which we even find in all the traditional religions, Oriental and Occidental? For example, in China, one of the ancient sages said, the Tao, or the God that can be talked about, is not the real God. Yet he went on in poetic aphorisms trying to talk about the untalkable. And I think, in a sense, this is tribute to what all the mystics of the various traditions have tried to say, namely that while any god we can talk about becomes an idol, hence a childish substitute for the search, still there is something deeply rooted in man's nature which makes him search for that which cannot be named. It's the search for truth, as described by the philosopher, and Socrates is the best Western example of this. I suspect that is the area, then, in which Freud and religion might most logically uh, be seen together. I was struck by one of Dr. Fromm's references to Freud as being in the anti-clerical tradition. And, of course, as we all know, this was a powerful tradition in the 19th century, Very founded so. by rationalism, by humanism, and it swore its opposition to the purely ritualistic aspects of religion which seemed to many people to have lost all connection with God as feeling, as experience. Is that not right, Professor Ross? Yes, and for me, Freud stands in the very honorable tradition of those who see through the superficiality of those religionists who think that God can be confined in a formula or an institution. In other words, he is closer to the mystic than he is to the cleric whom he criticizes. The mystic is simply the poet, the sensitive person who refuses to say or admit that experience can be defined in the terms of his definition. I doubt whether Freud would have ever owned up, though, Dr. Rudin, to the term mystic, would you say? <laughs> he, uh, I think, was in the position of having to constantly deny this, uh, even as it was being applied to him, and uh, even in his basic works. Well, nobody seems to like the term mystic. Let me uh, switch away from that and put it a little bit differently. As I see it, and even as I read many of my colleagues in the field of theology and comparative religions today, Freud was saying, the trouble with religion as I see it in my society is that it caters to man's fantasy, tendencies, his childish wish fulfillment themes. In other words, religion as he saw it was just a kind of one long drawn out use of aspirin. Now even doctors today recognize that there are times when aspirin should be prescribed. But what it does is really to take away the pain or remove the symptoms without getting at the underlying causes. And Freud, it seems to me, was making it possible for a more mature religionist to get on with the task of recognizing that religion can never be equated with its forms or its dress or its symbols at any given time. That seems to me to be a very profound insight indeed, and I wonder if that doesn't have a good deal to do by way of explanation of the present so-called religious revival in the United States and in perhaps other parts of the Western world. What I'm thinking of is the undeniably large number of people who during the past five to ten years, perhaps a little farther back, 
have been drawn once again into a kind of religious interest that very probably they had lacked during the earlier parts of their lives. But for whom, it seems to me in many instances, religion is a search for just another means of easy adjustment to life around them. And the crime is that there are too many people, even close to the religious fraternity, who are willing to capitalize upon this kind of search. Whereas mature religion at its best has always said, the child must not only work through his relationship to the mother and actually slay her in her possessive aspect, he must go on and identify with the father, the principle of the spirit, of the psyche, of the mind, and then, having done that, if he's going to escape legalism and moralism and the rigidity of orthodoxy, he must slay the father in his terrible aspect and become the hero. We find this in the myths of Hinduism, of Buddhism, of the uh, Norse, in fact, the myths of all the peoples of the human race. And yet, in the current uh, religious revival, uh, we're settling for... Uh, an acquisition of the mother rather than any kind of identification with the father. We're settling for uh, possessing the mother component of religion, the formal structured uh, church, the uh, gratification of dependent needs and this sort of thing. And I think this is even related to the fact that we have developed a system of government also which tends to encourage this, wittingly or unwittingly, and probably mostly the latter, Namely, it plays upon our fears and our anxieties and leads us then to turn increasingly to figures in authority as though they were the all-embracing mother. We can always find security hiding behind the walls of the Pentagon or the bomb. That's right. I think anyone has to recognize that one of the most distinctive features of the mid-20th century has been the widening search for some kind of protective authority some kind of fortress of security for community, and oftentimes, it seems to me, people are unwilling to face the consequences of what genuine community and genuine status require. And the result is, I'm afraid, we have a great many nostrums being sold on the market at the present time. And I have in mind here specifically certain types of newspaper column that are written for mass circulation which seemed to me to vulgarize, it's usually Christianity, which seemed to me to vulgarize Christianity beyond anything that has ever been known before. Yes, I think we've tended to make of Christianity in this country a religion for sucklings. Uh, however, let's uh, remember your own comment, Professor Ross, that occasionally we have use for these nostrums. Uh, that uh, the aspirin has its place yes. uh, in the treatment armamentarium. And it may very well be that these particular nostrums have their place in maintaining a certain level of equilibrium in individuals, that we need to go beyond this, certainly, right. in seeking for the identification uh, with a father is uh, certainly unquestionable. Yes, I'd like to refer to something which has come up uh, in some of the discussions here on Fromm and Freud. Namely, man needs to learn how to handle his polarities or his tensions. And just as we all have a need for security, no matter what our age, so we also have a real need for adventure or exploration. Now, the danger in our time is we have overstressed the search for security. We've made a fetish out of security, from the military complex clear on down to the home. Now, I think if we look at the religions themselves at their other level, we discover that one of the things that stands out, and let's just talk about the Western religions, is, to quote, that Abraham went out by faith. He had no road map telling him what lay ahead in Palestine and where he could find further guides. He went out by faith. Now this, I think, is the other dimension. Dr. Fromm referred to it uh, once in a previous discussion. To go out by faith means that one goes out with confidence in his own potentialities for finding meaningful relationships. And to go out with, if you will forgive me for using a very much overworked word, to go out with humility also. Definitely. And I think one of the uh, characteristics of contemporary thought that, for me at least, is just as real as the tendency of vulgarization that I referred to a few moments ago is the very honest humility that seems to me to have characterized a great deal of the writing and the thought of our time. All I have to do is to compare the philosophy, the literary criticism, the novels, the drama, 
the essays, occasional essays in the general area of the social sciences, compare those as they are being written today with those of a generation to go. And I think there is quite a different tone in them from what we knew a generation ago. Well, this is another aspect that we should not ignore. While there is a lot of this infantile religion being propagated and encouraged in our country at the present time, there are also signs in many areas, including the physical sciences, that a good many people are digging a little deeper into this question of the dynamics of human behavior, human motivation, and the search for truth. And I have a feeling that given a few more decades, we may become of age, as it were, to a much greater extent than we are at the present time here in our American culture. Uh, aren't we faced with the basic natural curiosities and the seeking for uh, adventure that you cited before, Professor Ross, that this has come through despite a uh, certain kind of uh, vulgarized admonitions uh, that one must not know truth? that one must uh, really not seek it because it is in some sort of unknowable, uh, forbidden territory. Or you get labeled as being an unpopular person yes. in your community. Yes. Our time is beginning to run out, but I would like to ask both Professor Ross and Dr. Rudin whether they believe that at the present time there is higher mutual respect between the practitioners, let us say, of psychiatry on the one hand and the representatives of the church on the other hand than prevailed in Freud's own mind. Professor well, Ross? Yes, this is very definitely true in the field of theological education. There's a great deal of cooperation now between the psychiatrists and the mental hospitals and the men teaching in the field of psychotherapy or the psychology of religion. And could I add one other note here also, which I think perhaps needs to be said frequently in each generation. If we're going to talk about religion in a mature sense, as over against these infantile forms of religion that will always torment us to some degree, don't we have to say that to be religious really means to be moved by ultimate concerns and not to sell out to the proximate concerns and the proximate fears and anxieties. And if this be true, then we're going to discover that there are all kinds of mature religious persons in all walks of life, even though many of them may be anti-clerical, and sometimes for good reasons. I think that's excellent. Dr. Rudin, would you care to make one final comment? I think I'd be gilding the lily. Dr. Floyd Ross, professor of world religions at the Southern California School of Theology, and Dr. Edward Rudin, chief psychiatrist of the Riverside State Mental Hygiene Clinic, I thank you for what has been an extremely provocative and profound discussion.